there will be um, many more there will be many more in biosis webinar series and i hope all of you will join us again in the future so a brief introduction here uh, in biosis webinar series is established to provide a knowledge and research experience sharing platform to ensure that we are still connected with each other and stay motivated in our research despite the sudden pandemic so as I mentioned earlier, uh, today we com commemorate the first joint in biosis AP Bionet webinar. And today we are honored that we have a president uh, of AP Bionet, Associate Professor Dr. Muhammad Asif Khan to be with us. And also uh, we are greatly humble and honored uh, with our uh, speaker today, Prof. Shoba Ranganathan, with I will uh, read her brief summary uh, uh, later on. Without further ado, I would like to call upon uh, Professor, Associate Professor Dr. Asif to give a few words before we start our webinar today. Hand over to you, Prof. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Zeti, uh, for the kind introduction and for the opportunity uh, to be able to say a few words today at the Joint in Biosis and Epibinet Talks uh, seminar. Uh, can I be given permission to share very quickly? Can I, can I yeah, do sure. that? Sure, oh, yes. Okay, perfect. So I'm just going to share a slide here. Can you see? Can everybody see? Yes. Okay, so I want to just uh, briefly introduce uh, EpiBinet Talks. So this is actually something uh, that we just recently launched, and uh, we are very proud of this initiative, and we want to, you know, quickly... I just want to let you know quickly about what it's uh, what is what does it in, include involve. Uh, so the this is like we have many slides, so I just choose uh, picked one slide that kind of sums up uh, what this is all about. So uh, the unique value propositions include it's meant to be inclusive, so it's open to anyone and everyone out there from the community who wants to contribute a talk, and even students, masters, PhD students who have something to share. Uh, they can come to us and, and you know, tell us about what they want to do, and we will be able to make the arrangement for them to share to the community. Uh, it's open access, it's going to be free of charge, and uh, it's meant to empower the community by sharing of knowledge. Of course, there's a lot already available on YouTube, but we felt that there's more that can be done, uh, especially on tutorials, hands-ons, and even you know, lectures, talks. There's just so much that's in bioinformatics that needs to be shared. And we have, uh, you know, very limited out there and more needs to be done. So we want to do our part in contributing to that pool of knowledge out there. So everything that we do, we will hold, we will be recording it. So people who couldn't join can then see it later at their own leisure through our YouTube channel. So um, it's, it's, and it's global. It's not, although we are AP Bionet, which is focused on Asia Pacific, but it's open. It's meant to invite everyone from around the world to contribute, uh, you know, something of value to the community. So, uh, so I'm really happy um, that we have already had uh, two sessions, two talks done. Uh, this will be, uh, we actually have one tomorrow. And today's, uh, today's talk is actually our first as a joint with a partner. And I'm really happy that the partner is in Biosis. Uh, I am actually based in Malaysia, although I'm currently seconded to Turkey. Uh, so I'm really happy that this is starting from Malaysia and, and you know, uh, none other than in Biosis. And what better way to make this happen uh, than inviting our former president and our current chairperson of AP Bionet Limited, Prof. Shoba Ranganathan. So it's really a great pleasure to have Prof. Shoba inaugurate this partnership uh, seminar between AP Bionet and in Biosis. Thank you very much. And I, I look forward to the talk from Prof. Shoba and there's a lot that we can learn from her. Thank you. Thank you, Zeti. And um, uh, yeah, looking forward to the talk from Prof. Shoba. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Asif, for your switch and uh, short speech. Uh, I will give you some housekeeping rules for our webinar today. The lecture will take about 45 minutes and the Q&A session will take approximately 15 minutes minimum, depending on how many numbers of questions that will be posed here. Okay, please submit the questions in the Zoom chat box and FB live page. And also we, uh, we will have uh, all these recording on the uh, AP Bionet YouTube channel. So uh, during the questions uh, session, I will read all the questions. Okay, and then before the seminar ends, I would like to invite all participants to switch on the camera for a photography session. 
And then please stay tuned until the end of the session to fill in the attendance form for e-certificate and uh, e-spell UM credit. Okay, so today I would like, uh, I am very honored to have our, uh, our Honourable Professor Shoba Rangadadan from Macquarie University, Sydney, to be uh, the first uh, speaker for the first joint uh, webinar between Imbiosis and AP Bionet. So please allow me to share with you uh, Prof Shoba's uh, CV. So Prof Shoba Ranganathan uh, is a professor and chair in bioinformatics at Macquarie University. And uh, she is one of the uh, women by a pioneer uh, uh, bioinformatician, uh, and she uh, are also the first vice president for AP Bionet. Uh, she has uh, held research and academic positions in various uh, countries, uh, such as India, U United States, Singapore, and Australia, as well as she has been actively involved uh, for a consultancy in industry. So Prof Shoba's research addresses several key areas of bioinformatics uh, to understand biological systems using computational approaches. And her group has achieved both experience and expertise in different aspects of computational biology, ranging from metabolites and small molecules to biochemical networks, pathway analysis, and computational systems biology. She also has authored uh, several several books as well as contributed several articles to Springer Encyclopedia of Systems Biology. She has a very um, wide uh, experience in uh, the field of bioinformatics and computational biology and she has uh, a lot of um, she has been uh, a lot of network Okay, so uh, without further ado, I would like to call upon uh, Prof Shoba uh, to share with us her uh, interesting talk today on the benchmarking de novo genome assembly methods. Please, Prof, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So can I share my screen? I'm very happy to be the first in biosis uh, speaker today uh, for the webinar series in 2021. And I'm also honored that this has been co-shared as an AP Bionet talk. I thank uh, Professor Zeti and Professor Rasif for their introductions. And I look forward to sharing some, some of our work with you. This is the work of a PhD student and I will be happy to present this uh, as quickly as I can share my screen, okay? Oh, wrong one. Oh, just give me a second, please. Uh, I don't seem to have the right file up. Okay, well, what happened to my file? I was working on a few talks and I think I got confused. So here we go. I can share my talk now. So share screen. Uh, wrong one. Biosis. Oh no, it says the wrong date and all that. So it should be 12 March 2021. Okay, right. So, we are looking at uh, assembling a genome and uh, we would like to give you a very brief introduction and then the lots of methods that we are looking at are reference genomes the results and the key points. I hope I have the correct PowerPoint slide. So uh, genome assembly is, has been represented as a puzzle because we have so many elements that we have to put together. And in fact, in 20, 2003, uh, the British government actually published uh, uh, a stamp to commemorate 
the genome, which is called the end of the beginning, putting the puzzle of the human genome together. Genomics itself was a term that was coined way back in 1986 uh, by the Jackson Lab geneticist, Dr. Tom Roderick. And uh, this is actually much, almost a decade after the large scale genome sequencing methodology developed by Sanger. And this is now called the first generation sequencing approach where fluorescently labeled tags were used to terminate primer sequences. And these colors were then observed using instruments. And then we get the four familiar genome sequencing label colors that we observed due to fluorescence. And that is what we see as our sequence today. A few years later, we have the Illumina or next gen sequencing coming up. A couple of methods are there, PacBio and Illumina. Illumina paired end sequencing is shown here, where we prepare a library of fragments with three prime and five prime ligated adapters. So we have the adapter, the insert sequence, and one more adapter here. And these sequences are added to the Illumina flow cell. Fragments are then amplified through bridge amplification in both forward and reverse directions and clusters of reads are formed. Again, we incorporate fluorescently labeled nucleotides base by base and then read the fluorescence signal for each cluster to determine the bases that were added. These are called NGS methods for short next gen sequencing. And similar to Sanger sequencing, they are constrained in the overall read length that can be produced at a reliable level. Nowadays, we have what we call third gen sequencing, TGS. And examples of these are Nanopore and PacBio Hi-Fi. Nanopore uses a totally different approach. And I have shown this here in the diagram. It uses a double-stranded DNA, which is then split into a single strand of unamplified DNA and passed through a protein nanopore across a membrane, which has a fixed uh, voltage applied across it. DNA single strand enters the pore with one strand passing through and the current in the membrane changes based on what DNA bases are actually physically entrapped within this pore. This change is then detected using semiconductor sensors, which is also called base calling. So this is an absolutely new approach. And in this way, very long pieces of DNA are able to be sequenced. Again, this is called the ONT Oxford Nanopore Technology. Sequencing itself has now gone on to many other higher levels. We also have high C reads, which form clusters and can help us to assemble longer fragments or even bridge gaps in our sequencing uh, when, when we have consensus reads that don't actually completely overlap. And these are the most commonly used methodologies that we see today, Illumina and long reads with PacBio and Nanopore and some high C to finally bridge the gaps. And this has been reviewed by Gianni et al in 2020. So please look for this review and you will be able to find it. So how then did we get caught up in all this? So. We actually were, have part of a big grant which uses sterile insect technologies to get rid of pests in Australia. These pests are the fruit flies, Australian fruit flies, which were to be genomically sequenced. Phil Taylor, my colleague, is the lead author of this grant. I am one of the... Uh, uh, the investigators representing bioinformatics and Rahul Rane 
and others here from the CSIRO team are our partners who actually have a lot of uh, uh, expertise in growing these flies, uh, extracting the DNA and sequencing them. And then we sit down and figure out what is the genome. This is quite different from Drosophila melanogaster, the vinegar fruit fly, which was sequenced way back in 2000. So this is the reason why we are involved in this grant. It was a very large grant from Horticulture Innovation Australia. And this actually is going to help us to control the spread of these fruit flies, especially because some of them, which were very tropical, are now moving into subtropical areas due to climate change. And this is a very big problem for Australia, which has a very large horticultural industry. So this was our basic plan. We would take uh, all the available methods, benchmark them, develop a pipeline, and then apply it to all our sequencing that we do on the Bacteriosera species, then do some comparative genomics, visualization and storage, sounded very simple. These are very novel organisms that we are going to work on, very far removed from Drosophila. They are eukaryotes and insects, not animals. But each study that we looked at reports uses uh, reported in the literature uses data that has different coverage and a whole different variety of tools. So it got to a point when we had to start with with the genome assembly, looking at the many different genomes that were sequenced for prokaryotes, but these were only done with long reads, no short reads or hybrid approaches had been used. A number of different methods have been used and this was benchmarked in 2020 by Wick and Holt. But for eukaryotic genome assembly, there was no shortcut because there doesn't seem to be any benchmarking available. We have lots and lots of short read data. Generally, both short reads and long reads are generated. Many, many, many methods have been reported. Draft assembly also needs error correction, especially for long read data. And this is called polishing. And this can be done with data from the same or different sequencing technologies. And we also have a plethora of polishing methods. So finally, we assembled a list of how many methods have been reported in the literature. Because if you do a benchmarking study, we have to cover the field. So we came up with 20 assemblers addressing Illumina, Nanopore, PacBio, and hybrid data, as well as polishing eight different polishers can be used. And depending on the data you have, this, this, some of these names you will find on different uh, technologies as well. But putting them together, we get eight polishers. And these can also be used on different types of data and in multiple combinations. Uh, so we had the fruit fly sequenced. And then we now are going to benchmark and apply it to these Bactrocera. And this is what we're going to do. And we have applied it to one or two species already, but everything is, you know, under comparative genomics, under review. And so finally, I guess we will publish sometime this year. So the data we collected for benchmarking are based on two model organisms, C. elegans, for which there is a lot of data and also Drosophila melanogaster, which is an insect and therefore very relevant to us. And you can see that before these two organisms, we do have Illumina, Nanopore and PacBio data for both and the coverage is very variable. Very different for the two organisms and uh, we wanted to also see if there were any coverage effects. So we were going to randomly pick data from each of these at different coverages and then see if there is also a minimum coverage 
that we require to get sequenced for eukaryotic genomes. These have effects on how much funding is required and how much data you need to produce, which types of data for the future for all genomic projects. How do we know that we have a good assembly? So we look at, looked at the metrics for evaluating the results. And then we compiled what we thought were reasonably good methods. So we have assembly stats, which gives you the N50 value and the total assembly size. BUSCO is very frequently used because we look for gene completion as genes are reported by this score. BUSCOMP is actually developed by a colleague who is in University of New South Wales, Rich Edwards. And bus comp completeness and identical scores are also calculated. There is also cost, which gives us details of SNPs and indels based on 100 kilo basis. And then red gives you total repeat length, which is also very significant for eukaryotic genomes. And when we did the benchmarking, we specifically chose a single computing node with 20 cores running Ubuntu and with only 128 gigabase of RAM. This actually tells us that this kind of small system can be found in many labs and therefore we wanted to benchmark on that. We didn't go for a high-end multi-computer system or um, one of these proprietary uh, systems because then we cannot actually provide something that is useful for the entire community. In order to see what is the coverage effect, we subsampled the data using a script called BBMAP. So this randomly generated 20x coverage, 40x coverage, etc. And then genome size estimates were 400 megabase pairs for C. elegans and 140 for D. melanogaster as the baseline using these subscripting uh, data uh, software. So we generated data at 20x, 40x, and used the complete data set full coverage for the two model organisms. And uh, there were over 14,000 assemblies made with all the different software that we ran. And the input data was three types, Illumina, Nanopore, and PacBio, both for C. elegans and for Drosophila. We pre-processed them, then assembled them. We, in these, we assembled indi individual data types and also ran hybrid assemblies. Then we did short read polishing, long read polishing, and then short read polishing final with long reads and hybrid polishing, et cetera. And then we looked at all the metrics that we already showed you in the earlier table. Okay, so how did we do? So here we have the results uh, for C. elegans assemblies. And we see here that we have the raw data and then the final statistics for each of the four types of runs that we carried out. Independent runs for Illumina, Nanopore, PacBio, and the hybrid. And then for the final statistics after all the work was done. Illumina alone does not get polished because it is already high quality data. And therefore, we have just transported these values in the second uh, set of graphs for comparison purposes. And I put gray boxes to indicate that. All the rest were polished with four rounds of long reads, followed by three rounds of short reads. Uh, and short read here being the Illumina data. Overall assembly size tends to increase with coverage. So when we go from 20x, which is in red, to 40x, which is in green, to full coverage, which is in blue, we do see some improvement in the assembly statistics. And two of the programs could not assemble 
more than 60 to 70 percent of the genome at 20x and these are Shasta and Falcon. And if you are using these programs, you do need coverage of more than 20x. Long read polishers tend to overestimate the genome size and you can see that uh, they just start going upwards. Uh, we could see that the polishers were here, but uh, when we did the final uh, assembly and uh, cleanup, that sort of corrected itself. Hybrid and Illumina are closer to the reference genome sizes. And the reference genome size as, uh, was estimated again using those programs for comparison and also compared with the real results that we already have. So continuing on, uh, we see that GC content and total repeat length are shown here. Once again, Illumina data was not polished. And for the other three, we noticed that 20x may give some errors or overestimation of both GC content and total repeat in the raw stage. But in the final stage, the total repeat length does come down to the baseline, although it's a little bit higher as far as the GC content go. But PAC bio and hybrid data are very much in the ballpark. So uh, repeats are not uh, improved by polishing and therefore that's something to be aware of. Uh, so we do know that uh, Illumina and hybrid approaches uh, are really doing well and they are probably giving the best result. PacBio is not far off, but PacBio data of course is a bit expensive. I believe 10X is coming back. So that's something we haven't considered. So gene completeness for the C. elegans assembly was estimated by BASCO scores, and they are quite good for Illumina and hybrid assembly that's shown in graph A, but overtaken by long read assembly after short read polishing shown in B, and also some data is here in E comparing the BASCO scores initial to final. BASCOMP, the other metric I was talking about is able to find more complete genes in the raw assemblies for long reads compared to BASCO. So we are wondering if this is a better predictor of the final assembly quality right away with the initial raw data. So as you can see, BASCOMP is here, the scores, and BASCO scores are here. So that's what we are looking at. This is also shown here. So the initial uh, BASCOM scores seem to be comparing well with the final assembly as estimated by BASCO. And it looks like it's a quick way to figure out what kind of final quality you might arrive at. When we look at 20X, 40X and full coverage, we see here that the BASCO scores uh, are definitely leaning towards longer coverage for Illumina and uh, Nanopore, some methods are doing better than the others. And the different methods have been uh, shown at the bottom. PacBio is quite good, but the hybrid seems to be doing well throughout. So maybe if you choose the right programs, uh, you can survive with only 20X coverage. It is a possibility. So when you go to hybrid, you do get good results. So low coverage can be polished up. Of course, it depends very much on the organism you have. But if you only have funding for 20X, that might be enough if you are able to select your programs carefully. So we see here that the best methods that we can see here are spades and soap. And fly for pack bio does very well. We also see that the top assemblies from cumulative Z scores, we have N50 that is getting higher and higher, higher the better. And all these data and tables are also available on GitHub. 
we have looked for complete busco score genes here and the higher the value it will be better similarly when we look at the percentage identical bus comp genes higher the value that will be better for snit errors we, we need lower numbers and for indel errors we need lower numbers so the z score looks at all these separate values as well and then we evaluate it so when we look at the cumulative z scores for the top 3 assemblies for each data type given that we had such a big matrix of methods to try out. We see here that Illumina is shown in uh, peach, uh, nanopore in green, uh, pack bio in cyan, and hybrid in purple. Uh, we see here from the cumulative z-scores that we actually find much better uh, performance for the full uh, fly doing very well in all approaches and Illumina is slightly low on the z-score side. If we look at the coverage uh, measurements, 20x and 40x are here compared to the full. So that's what we could actually figure out and the best method still remain fly, especially fly does very well on pack bio data for all coverage types. And fly does very well for nanopore, full and uh, 20x, uh, slightly lower for 40x. So we could actually compare the different methods and the coverage data to figure out the best possible outcomes for each of the runs. Some of the details are here. For Illumina, Spades and Mazurka performed the best. Spades is here. And for Nanopore, Fly and Raven did very well. And for Pack Bio, Fly and Kanu did the best, but Kanu is extremely slow. So unless you have lots of time on your hands and can spare a big computer, it's perhaps not a good idea. And hybrid overall mazurka and mazurka and fly did extremely well. So the data is here and it's a lot of data, but everything has to be sorted and it's just a snapshot of the data has been shown here. So, and Hassler and PacBio do very well at 40X coverage and the DBG2 OLC does well at, at the lower coverage ends. So that's what we could get at. And for 20X, the best methods are shown here. And the number of times we need to polish, nobody has actually benchmarked that. We just did it till we got no more better improvement and then we stopped. So we've got a different uh, set of numbers when we come to the polishing strategy. When we look at uh, Melanogaster, applying the same methods, we're only showing you brief results. We again see that the BASCO score is quite good for Illumina and hybrid raw assemblies. Here, that's what we see, the BASCO scores. Uh, but overtaken by nanopore assemblies after short read polishing, that's shown here and here. Buscomp is again able to find more complete genes in the raw assemblies, that's here, Buscomp, and in the raw assemblies for long reads compared to Busco, that's shown here in D. Again, the Buscomp genes give us a very good idea <coughs> of the <coughs> percentage completeness of the raw assembly similar to BUSCO genes in the final assembly D that's shown here. And it could be a very good predictor of what we are going to get. The color scheme, if you've forgotten, peach is Illumina, green is nanopore, pack bios in cyan, and uh, the, the purplish one is the hybrid in these diagrams. 20X coverage is in red, 40X in green, and the full coverage is in a shade of blue. And the different shapes indicate 20x, 40x, and full coverage. 
So we can see that we are able to get somewhere. And the top three assemblies for each data type were again compared. And again, we note that Fly is doing very well for Nanopore and PacBio data. Kanu does do very well for PacBio data, but only for 40X and full coverage, doesn't want to run or assemble at lower coverages. So we can see here that all the Z-scores are positive compared to the previous one where the Z-scores for Illumina were negative. But then we, I think we have more or uh, different kinds of coverage for uh, uh, Melanogasta compared to uh, C. elegans, and that could be the difference. So to summarize, we have hybrid and long read assemblies generating more contiguous assemblies than short reads. This might improve with high C scaffolding, but not everybody does high C. So although we generated high C for some of our special uh, Bactrocera species, we have not done any benchmarking there. Hybrid long assemblies look good, but long read assemblies after polishing are actually better. So maybe that is a strategy that we need. And the assemblers, how did they perform? For Illumina, Spades was to top of the list, followed by Mazurka and RAP. W2 RAP was actually very fast. Nanopore Fly did very well. Raven was good after polishing. Shasta was at high coverages. Kanu is similar, but very, very slow. And similarly for Pack Bio, Fly and Kanu did very well. Also, Falcon did very well at high coverages, although it was quite slow. For hybrids, Mazurka and Mazurka plus Fly did well. Also, Hasler, but only under high coverage and with Pack Bio data. Overall, the best was Oxford Nanopore and Pack Bio CLR assemblies plus short read data for polishing that produced the consistently better hybrid assemblies, uh, but it was a bit slow. Illumina only assemblies are also more accurate, but they are definitely more fragmented. So because they, only, they are only short reads, but they had a much better per base coverage. So Illumina is something that everybody should consider and maybe one of the other a long read methods, and then you would get a good result. So we feel that peak performers when weighing only key metrics were Spades and Mesurka for Illumina, Fly for Nanopore and PacBio, and DBG2LC and Hassler for the hybrid assemblies. Polishing is essential for long read assemblies, and hybrid polishing with Hypo worked very well for ONT and PacBio. Long read polishing followed by short reading polish, polishing is also good. And then short read only polishing is sufficient for the best raw pack bio assemblies such as those produced by Fly Arcano. So depending on what data you have, you can actually figure out the strategy. We are also putting together a pipeline which given the data will automatically choose the methods and do the runs and also give you the ability to run this. This is being set up because so many methods have to be put together and uh, tutorials have to be made, but it's underway uh, and uh, it will be available maybe sometime later. Coverage can improve the assembly quality, but if you have only limited funds or are working on some strange organisms and want to do a pilot study, 20X coverage may be enough but of long reads of either type with 20X coverage of short reads. And you would still get comparable quality with a lot of savings in both time and money. And though this may change for more difficult to assemble genomes of totally novel organisms. So we are developing a pipeline called Pyro. It's on the way, not ready yet. And we have tried to apply it to Arabidopsis thaliana and we've got some very good results from Mazurka, Fly, 
Again, fly for pack bio, fly for nanopore, and Mesoca plus fly for hybrid using the results from the benchmarking, and it's all getting written up. So that's all I have to say because I wasn't sure how long this introduction would be and also to give you some time to ask questions. So we do have some extra slides, but I think I will stop sharing and ask you for some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Shoba, for the very interesting talk. So um, I shall I start with the question? <laughs> Okay, so uh, I wonder for the uh, cumulative z-score, what are the uh, component or what are the um, parameters uh, have been used to calculate this, this score and what is the threshold uh, to show that the uh, results is acceptable? Thank you. So, this is Okay. All right. Okay, Prof. Uh, I can't hear you. Uh, what's wrong? Okay. Okay. So for the, I think we need to share again so I can show you the Z score. The exact calculation uh, is, is it actually uses a weighted thing. So uh, in the paper, we'll have the full details, but we used N50, uh, percentage of Vasco genes, percentage of Vascom genes, SNP errors, and indel errors. And that's how we calculated the Z score. And I refer to the GitHub site, it might have the correct or the updated uh, z-score calculation. But then with all this data, we could actually put together the z-score value. I'm happy to also uh, post any details or further uh, by email or email it to you. Thesis is under review, so I don't know if I can give you all the details right now. Uh, Zethi, could I ask a follow-up oh, sorry. Question? All right. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, please do. Uh, thank you, Prof. Shoba, for uh, the very insightful talk. And uh, we ourselves are currently working on um, de novo assembly. So this was very timely. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, with regards to the Z-score, initially for Illumina, you showed that they were below zero. And then towards the end, uh, they were positive. So, sorry, maybe I missed something. What did, what was done so that they were recovered, and why were they negative initially? Um, because you said they were. No, no, sorry, no. Sorry, they, uh, they did not recover. Actually, the Z score uh, for, is for different organisms. Uh huh. So the first uh, set of slides uh, were for. Uh, C elegance and that is still negative. Hmm. So is that concerning the fact that Z scores were negative for Illumina when you showed that most of the some of the best results were Illumina from Illumina? So kind of conflicted. Uh, but the best results were from Illumina, but the best results were also very short. Uh, hmm. The assembly is very fragmented for for hmm. Illumina. That is the problem. I see. I see. Okay. okay. I can show the slides again. Is that is that uh, something yep. you would like? Yep. Yep. That'll be, oh, that'll be helpful. Let me go and get my slides again. So, share PowerPoint. Okay. So, uh, the results. Uh, mm, I need In to the put graph. Yep. Coming up. Coming up. So the results here. This one is for C elegance. Mm -hmm. And it does show negative z-scores for Illumina, but mm -hmm. positive for all the others. Mm -hmm. And the second lot is actually uh, for Melanogaster. And here all the scores are positive, positive, although they are very small. But still, Ill Illumina does very well. Only problem is the Illumina is very similar to this 
picture that I showed you from the review article. Hmm. The Illumina assembly is extremely fragmented. Hmm. It's very high quality, but only comes in short segments. Whereas the nanopore maps are much longer and we are able to get much better contigs with both the short read and the long read hybrids. And you might have to do high C to actually fix the gaps in the long reads mm -hmm. and the hybrid scaffolding. So that is the final step, but that's not been considered for the benchmarking. I mentioned this before, mm -hmm. but if you have specific genomes, you can also do the high C scaffolding. So the, re the results are different for the different data sets that I'm showing. There are two data sets and uh, sorry, I should just quickly go on to the results for you. This one, this one was actually uh, negative from the 40th. Okay. okay. Shall I stop sharing? Is that okay, Asif? Yeah, happy yeah, yeah. thanks. Yeah, thanks, Prof. Um, and maybe okay, if there are if many one questions question. in uh, the chat box. Sure. Just one quick yeah. one. Um, what is the prospect of Nanopore being uh, a dominant, uh, you know, sequencing platform moving forward? Given that you know it's longer reads, um, and and you know the benchmarking that you did, do you think uh, this could be something? for people to consider nanopore? Uh, yes, at least you need one long read and one short read to get excellent results. That is our opinion. And uh, nanopore is definitely cheaper than PacBio unless you have a deal with PacBio. So I think maybe I, uh, we could at least consider uh, one long read and one short read to pro produce very good quality results. Thank so you. That Bhushan. is the way to actually go. Of course, if you can, uh, uh, you can, if you can do both, that will be great. And even 20x coverage at both, using both uh, technologies will practically give you a better quality output. Okay. Thank you. So Thank one you, lady has asked, uh, what do I do for 20x coverage? Mm -hmm. uh, the results are here. Uh, the assembly assembly for for short reads. Uh, the ones we found that did very well are actually uh, Spades and Mazurka for uh, Illumina data, and that would be the best method to use. It's also here. Spades and Mazurka Spades uh, was the best for Illumina for twenty x, so that might be something that lady can consider. I saw that uh, on the uh, chat box. So that's something to use. Uh, also, there is a whole list of methods. So I'm happy to answer questions separately, if you wish. Is the assembly haploid? Which pipeline would be used facing a diploid genome? Uh, these are all diploid genomes, aren't they? C. elegans and uh, this thing, the assembly actually comes out only as a single string. And uh, we believe that the other uh, DNA would actually be the complement. So that's how most of these methods assemble the genomes. Why are the results different between the organisms? That's because of the data coverage and whatever data we got in the public domain, we have used. So that is the best we could find. We saw many organisms, but many have only two uh, types of data, not three. And in some cases, the papers say the data is there and it's downloadable, but we could not find the data in any of the public repositories. Uh, it's the same with some of the recent papers. Everybody says they submitted data to the database, but there's nothing in the database or it's hidden. So we had to take what we got and we chose C. elegans because it's got a lot of experimental information. The every gene is practically well established. And similarly, uh, Drosophila has been well studied. 
Drosophila is also an insect and therefore relevant to our studies. But these methods should technically be applicable to most eukaryotic genomes. We are actually waiting for other pest organisms to be sequenced, and we are going to apply these approaches to see how they cope. That's why we applied it in the, uh, in the pipeline study to Arabidopsis thaliana, and we got very, very good results. I showed you some of the graphs. I didn't show you everything because it's uh, another long process. But since we got that far, we think that we have a very good chance of getting the other unknown genomes also. Can we use genomics technology in plant crop improvements? Uh, I'm not actually a, a plant biologist, but I do have colleagues here who are doing genomics to improve plants. And I can put you in touch with the colleague, Brian Atwell, who's here. And uh, he might be able to advise you on that. <laughs> Prof, uh, I wonder, uh, one of the steps in your pipeline is uh, on the data polishing, right? Yes. So would you, uh, would you share with us what are the uh, steps that you use in polishing the data? Yes, sure. Yes, thank you. We said so somewhere. I'm just trying to find it for you. Okay. Uh, all the polishing was done. No. I can't find the... Just give me a second to find the thing. So... I think all of them were polished four times with the long read and three times with the short reads. And that's uh, till they got consistency. So that's what we have done here. I'm just trying to find the shy. Ah, here it is. Illumina alone was not polished. You can see that. Because Illumina is short reads and we don't polish it. It's never been polished. So we can polish it, but it doesn't seem to improve much. So Illumina is shown here. Rest were polished with four rounds of long reads followed by three rounds of short reads. So the same data can also be used to polish this, uh, the data. And that's how the polishing was done. Also different methods shown here take different types of data. Yeah. So not everything would take the same kind of uh, uh, this thing. So we had to actually choose uh, methods and the data and put pipe, pipe them through that. Oh, oh, please. Um... So I hope that is satisfactory. So we used four rounds of long reads and three rounds of short reads for the polishing, especially for the hybrid. Mm. Okay. So this right. is for the hybrid and the rest we can actually polish using the same data again and again and or try with the short read. So we have done both. And in the end, whatever we got, everything was then benchmarked and based on the z-score it was put together that's how the it is a cumulative z-score so mm -hmm. we just have to see with, uh, which one has higher n50 so you score it that way the bigger the number it gets a better weightage and then you score with higher busco genes and then buscom genes and then lower this will be negative snip errors and indel errors so that's how you get your cumulative z-score. Okay, so Prof, uh, with the spec, uh, system spec that you showed uh, earlier, uh, how long does it take to complete the whole process for 
uh, the, the Australian fruit fly analysis? Oh, fruit fly is not shown here. So we are only shown here C. elegans and yep. melanogaster for C. Uh -huh. Yep. Fruit fly is much more complicated organism and it's also a novel organism. Mm -hmm. Some methods didn't work. Some of the things had to be tweaked. But for C. elegans and nanopore, we have the CPU time here. And uh, the methods here, some of them are very fast for Illumina, nanopore, pack bio and uh, hybrid. <coughs> some of the methods are extremely slow, mm. like uh, DB2, uh, DBG2 OLC hybrid actually took uh, about uh, close to more than seven hours for mm. hybrid assembly. And Falcon pack bio takes a long time as well, three hours, more 3.5 hours for the full coverage. Uh, but some, many of the others are reasonable. In mm. four hours, you can actually finish the work. Melanogaster took actually longer than the C. elegans. Mm. And we do not know why all these things take more time or less time. And uh, uh, for some of them, we did not show the data when it took too long. We just removed it from the graph. But spades takes over 12 hours for hybrid. Falcon takes 12 hours for the pack bio data, whereas for uh, nanopore and illumina, you can you can easily manage under four hours for nanopore and just over four hours with mazurka for uh, for uh, the raw data for illumina, and this was for melanogaster. As you can see, this is two to eight, and this is already up to 16 hours. So each each set data set seems to require better handling. The coverage was not that different, but we have no idea why this takes so long or so little time. The methods also have been summarized based on this kind of study, based on the CPU time as well, as well as the results. So we've looked at both. We also saw that memory usage can vary from program to program. The worst was Falcon, which PacBio provides. It actually requires a lot and lot of memory. So does Raven for some of the data. And uh, some of the older methods like Platinus, which is not very commonly used, but we benchmarked everybody. So you can see that they, they also require a whole lot of memory use, usage. Some of the other methods are very good. Mazurka does very well with limited coverage and gives good result. And Mazurka fly is here and spades is at the very end. Uh, some of the uh, programs did not run on some of the assemblies, which is why we have a gap here for the 40X. It is not only the options in running the code, okay. but also different flags are required. And I think Pendy Tong had asked the question. I think all those details are actually provided uh, on the uh, GitHub website, mm. even how to run each of these programs to actually get an output. So Prof, this, uh, the results will be uh, published soon? Because I think uh, the one that you did yes, is very yes, we useful. are waiting for thesis reports to come in before. Okay. We oh, that's good. All right. Yes, so they might yes. ask for more changes. So we thought might as well do everything when we submit mm. the manuscript. So it's mm. getting ready and we are also doing some more methods, I think, for the paper. Oh, that'd be awesome. Thank you, Prof. So there are mm. some questions I didn't answer. I'm trying to look at them. Work has not been published. So... Uh, due to this white to do hybrid between optical mapping and Illumina for short read. Uh, 
uh, any two methods would actually give good results and even 20x seems to give good results. So that's what we benchmarked here. So we could see that 20x was sufficient to get good uh, results for these two organisms. And uh, the pipeline has been set up and uh, can actually run uh, uh, for uh, any of these approaches. Yes, there are plenty of options. I address that. Uh, there are many flags also that need to be properly set for each of these programs. And that itself is a bit of a mess, but we can actually do that. And we have uh, uh, given on the GitHub site the commands for running each of these programs efficiently. Uh, we do not know the circular consensus sequencing method. Uh, we have not uh, analyzed that data, but uh, PacBio by itself seems to be a bit more on the uh, high side of the budget. So if you can do the PacBio, that will be good, but you might need some support and maybe you can benchmark the circular consensus sequencing versus the conventional CLR. So I hope this will encourage people to actually do more work and supplement what we have done. Okay. So, uh, Prof, have you answered the the one uh, due to money constraint? Is it to do wise to do sequencing hybrid? Have you answered that one? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. I said the twenty x, but using two. That was in the last summary slide. Mm. Yep. So having 20x coverage of long reads of either type with 20x coverage of short reads may be sufficient to still produce comparable quality, considerably slaving time and money. But if we are not sure because we do not know what kind of organisms people are working with. If it's a totally strange or new organism, might be, it might require more coverage and I don't know how to predict that. I don't think anybody will be able to help predict that. <laughs> there is another question, Prof. Uh, could you please explain why did the long read polisher tend to overestimate the genome size? No, we, we really don't know why these things happen. And the polisher perhaps tries to assemble too many things and it's uh, over eager and tries to extend. So we do not know because we are not developing in any of these methods. And if you read the papers for each of the methods, it's only been benchmarked against one data set. So this seems to be another problem that we face. Uh, we do not know, but that can actually be, uh, be fixed with different rounds of polishing you, and or with using short read data that manages, we, we are able to actually uh, bring that down to proper size. Mm. We do check with using bus comp and bus co whether where we are compared to the real reality, because for both these genomes, we have the full set of genes known. So that helps us to understand why we are actually getting overestimation of the size. It's mm. a process assembly. So I think that's the reason why this happens. Okay. So what uh, what will be the challenges if you uh, work on the human genome? Will it be a different set of challenges that will occur? Uh, Prof, uh, you unmute, please. Okay, the human genome seems to have, uh, uh, we are not working on human genome because so many people have already worked on it. Much of the data that is available also, much of the benchmarking studies are for single chromosomes. We haven't done single chromosomes also because we are, we are our main aim was to apply this directly to our pest genomes, which are insects. Okay. So that has been our, aim in this study. But if somebody would like to do that, that would be a great thing to do. Maybe I was thinking human and mouse would be good, but it's a lot of data and a lot of coverage. 
and we are not really sure how much to tone it down. But it won't pick up things like variants and things, and people are already into multiple problems with the human genome. So maybe we should just focus on that. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, I believe um, there is no more questions, but I think it is a very, uh, in, very, very in, informative and useful knowledge that we have today because I know there are many uh, research uh, in Malaysia doing on this genome analysis as well. Yeah, so we look forward to have, uh, to have your article published and use it as a reference. Okay, so I would like to thank you again, Prof Shoba, for your time and your uh, knowledge uh, sharing with us today. And I hope to have you back again soon for your another, <laughs> for your another interesting talk. Thank you, right. Zeti. And I can confirm that the ZSCO was simply, uh, I think, uh, an assembly of all the uh, metrics that we uh, talked about. It's yep. just a simple sum. Mm -hmm. with the plus and minus incorporated for that, yep. that way if you can actually estimate it. Yes, cool. It wasn't a very complicated math, so there was no real formula or anything. Okay, thank you, Pro. So uh, so I would like to ask all participants and speaker to on their camera, a camera for the photography session so we can immortalize this uh, session. So, right. So now we have uh, actually during the, the talk, we have about uh, 2007 participants uh, in Zoom and 28 participants on FB Live. So th this is a very good turnout. Thank you very much, all participants. Yes? 207, not 2007. Uh, no, 207, sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay, so... Maybe my team can do the intern. Could you please? Okay, maybe. Okay. One, two, three, smile. Okay, another one. One, two, three, smile. Okay. Okay, thank you. Right. So I would like to thank all of the participants and also the technician uh, in helping us setting up the uh, smooth uh, Zoom webinar today. Right. So then uh, the last um, the last message from the housekeeping is like uh, the participant can scan the QR code later. Okay, and then uh, it is only available for ten minutes. Okay. So then have a great uh, Friday afternoon and a great weekend to all of you. Thank you very much and hope to see you all again. Thank you, Prof. So can I leave now? No photograph? Yeah, all, all done yet yeah, just now. Okay. okay. Thank okay, you very thank much. You, I hope I answered okay. questions. I'm feeling rather sleepy now. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry if I have to make you stay back at work. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. So enjoy your dinner. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Everybody. Thank, thank you. Me. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Asif. Thank you.